Today we're going to talk about a famous argument from a British philosopher named Anthony Flew, and he gives a story, it's a parable of the invisible gardener. Uh, and the broader context here is that in 1944, and this must have been in the midst of Nazi bombings of London, Anthony Flew, R.M. Hare, and Basil Mitchell got together and had a panel discussion on theology and falsification, and they started to began a dialogue about what, if anything, religious claims mean. Uh, Flu has his doubts that they mean anything at all. So a number of really important questions that came up in their discussion are questions like, what would constitute disproof for a religious claim? In what ways does the world appear different when a religious claim is true versus false? Uh, under what circumstances should a believer or non-believer be prepared to change his mind? And by extension, Flew's question uh, to us is, hypothetically, what would it take to lead you to change your mind? So Flew starts with this famous story. Flew says, well, um, suppose we have two explorers, and they come to a clearing in the jungle with some flowers and some weeds. And upon arriving there, the believer among the two explorers takes a look and insists that there's a gardener who takes care of this place. The skeptic, being a skeptic, is not so convinced. So they set up fences, alarms, bloodhounds, uh, cameras, and the like in order to see uh, what's going on. And the presumption at the outset here seems to be that whether or not there is a gardener is something that can be settled by some evidence that these methods of investigation will maybe show what's going on. The gardener, if there is one, will have a detectable presence in the world. And it sure looks like at the outset that the um, believer is accepting the premise of the argument. And of course, what this is starting to sound more and more like is the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Predator. and. Uh, unfortunately, they don't find a predator, and Arnold doesn't get to have his classic battle. Uh, Flu's explorers don't find any evidence at all. They, their efforts to try to confirm or disconfirm that there is a gardener show uh, reveal nothing. The bloodhounds don't bark. There's nothing that sets off their tripwires. Their traps aren't thrown. No evidence whatsoever. So now the believer does something really interesting, and this is the crux of what the point that Flu wants to make. The believer now, in effect, backpedals. The believer now says, well, the gardener is invisible. He's intangible. He doesn't have any smell. He doesn't make any sounds. He comes secretly to care for the garden. And the skeptic is quite distraught about this. The skeptic despairs. Well, what remains of your original assertion? Just how does what you call an invisible, intangible, eternally elusive gardener differ from an imaginary gardener or no gardener at all? What were you saying in the first place if there's nothing that would count? And this raises the question, well then, what does the first claim, there is a gardener, actually mean? The skeptic now thinks that the believer, uh, uh, now thinks that the believer's original assertion doesn't have any meaning. And the skeptic's presumption here is that there is a gardener doesn't say anything if there's nothing in the world that would count for or against its truth, and the believer's not the believer's position is not looking so good here, uh, given that he's backpedaled and he's not allowing anything to change his mind. So the question becomes: Are there any conceivable circumstances which the believer would allow as showing there wasn't a God after all, or God doesn't really love us? Would the believer have changed his mind? Um, and if not, we've got to wonder along with Flu with, about what did their first assertion mean and, and what is the status of the reasonableness or the rationality of this position that the believers uh, sketched out. So Flu wants to know uh, if God exists or God loves us or true, but nothing can disconfirm them, what exactly do they mean? And what Flu's got in mind here is that uh, the original claim should have been construed as an assertion. That is, if religious claims are to be taken seriously, if the rest of us are supposed to listen, if the skeptic is supposed to uh, think that there's any sort of content to the believer's claim, it's got to be an assertion. And an assertion has a special status for Flu. Um, it means something special. So this takes us to this broader background, background issue. What is an assertion? 
So technically speaking, here's what Flew's got in mind. To assert that some claim P is true is to claim that it is not the case that not P. That is, if you think that one thing's true, you're saying the world is not another way. If I say there is, uh, that Michael Jordan exists, then I'm saying a world with no Michael Jordan is not an accurate description of the world. So a world minus Michael Jordan is not what I'm, is what I'm denying. I'm denying the case that he's not there. I'm saying he is there. There is some state of affairs, namely the one where P isn't true, that isn't an accurate description of reality. So Sherlock's, Sherlock Holmes isn't real. What does that mean? It means that there is no actual human with remarkable reasoning powers who wears a deerstalker cap and who solved hard crime cases for Scotland Yard in the 19th century. The guy in this picture is an actor. So there isn't really a Sherlock Holmes, and we're making an assertion when we say this guy isn't real. So what Flew's got in mind is that if a religious claim is consistent with or cannot be disproven by any state of affairs, then it doesn't really say anything meaningful at all. It's just talk. It's just, maybe it's just gibberish. It's something else. It's some other kind of speech act. It's not actually giving us um, a claim about a state of affairs in the world. Okay, so what kind of theism is Flew attacking? Who's he going after here? What sort of criticisms? Um, which, which class of theist is he after? Well, I think Flu probably suspects that all uh, believers are guilty of making some sort of mistake like this, but in terms of the kinds of philosophical positions we've been considering this semester, um, we can say this. He doesn't seem to really be going after evidential theism or natural theology. That is, we've been talking about lots of philosophers. For many philosophers we've considered, they have an answer to this question. Suppose you ask them, in what ways would the world be different if God didn't exist? And somebody like Swinburne, who we looked at earlier, he argued that the order and structure of physics proves God. So presumably, if the world didn't manifest those features that he pointed to as evidence, then the God conclusion wouldn't follow. In our discussions about God, we typically have the unspoken assumption that the reasons, the evidence we are giving, they make a difference, that if things were different, then the same conclusion wouldn't follow. We also have the presumption that when we disagree, um, that once all of the relevant information has been shared and everyone is in agreement about the facts, and once we've applied the canons of inductive and deductive logic to the evidence correctly, then one and only one conclusion will be entailed. There'll be one right answer. But the believer's response here suggests that the appeal to evidence wasn't genuine in the first place. He wasn't really serious about that. So Flew wants to get at one of the more fundamental issues of what these assertions are and how they're related to the world. So Flew's after something that we might call non-disconfirmable theism, where the difference between God's presence or absence in the world is empirically undetectable. It doesn't seem to make any difference one way or another whether God's there. But we've got to out now ask um, about this general attack <clears throat> that Flew's making. Is it true that in order to be meaningful, all claims must be subject to empirical verification? And it turns out that this is the major point of contention between Flu and especially R.M. Hare, who we're going to talk about in our next lecture, and to some extent Basil Mitchell. So um, we're getting now down to one of the, the sort of root presumptions in Flu's story. Um, is it right to say that in order to be meaningful, all claims must be subject to empirical verification? Now, Flu is inspired here by a movement uh, in philosophy called logical positivism. And this is a group of no-nonsense, um, highly uh, empirical philosophers in the early 20th century Vienna who insisted on this principle of verificationism. So Flew was trained by these philosophers, and he's taken his inspiration from them. They said this. They said, in order to be meaningful, all claims must be subject to empirical verification. Now, that all seems well and good, and it seems to uh, serve our skeptic well in our jungle scenario. But then, after positivism made, one, made this sort of sweep of popularity through uh, philosophical circles, somebody asked this question, can we empirically verify that sentence, in order to be meaningful, all claims must be subject to empirical verification? <laughs> 
That is, do we have empirical verification of this claim that all meaningful claims are empirically verifiable? And that brings out a crisis for logical positivism because they had invoked this principle that tied meaningfulness to empirical verification and they said everything that's meaningful has to be empirically verified but you can't empirically verify that sentence. They had invoked a sentence that defies the very thing that they were trying to prove. Um, this sometimes gets called a self-referentially inconsistent statement or a self-referentially incoherent uh, sentence. Uh, that is, this principle that they invoke can't satisfy itself. You've got to have some other reasons for adopting the principle than the sorts of reasons that it allows as admissible. Okay, so it turns out that while much of our knowledge is empirical, there's no way to empirically prove that all knowledge must be empirical without begging the question. So this is taken to be a pretty powerful objection to this major uh, underlying principle of, uh, of uh, logical positivism. Uh, so, philosophers have since uh, uh, backed off or moved away from this exp extreme uh, empirical trend in logical positivism. They've adopted a softer view about it. But I think we still should, should take some inspiration from Flew here. Does Flew have a, still have a good question, even though we've got this problem with verificationism in the background? That is, if somebody looks at the world and seems to conclude on that basis that God exists. They point to miracles, or they point to evidence, or they point to historical grounds for thinking that Jesus was resurrected, or they uh, uh, seem to derive their uh, evidence, their reasons for believing in God from stuff they see out there, then isn't it legitimate to ask the opposite question, what sorts of observations would lead you to conclude that God doesn't exist? If you're pointing to God, pointing to the world to show that God is real, then hypothetically, what would make you think the contrary view is true? Is God the sort of thing that makes a discernible difference in the world one way or another? And these still seem to be legitimate questions to ask that are inspired by Flew's uh, approach. And we've got to wonder, what exactly is it when somebody says God exists? What difference what, what impact does that have on the world? What, how would things be different if it weren't true? And then the skeptics, or um, there's a group of philosophers now pursuing arguments um, in a genre called divine hiddenness, are asking this question, how come the world appears to look in so many ways just like we'd expect it to look if there was no God in it at all? Uh, why is God hiding? Why is he doing it so well? Why does it look just like it would look as if there is no God? Now, the believer in flu story doesn't seem to have a very good answer. The believer is just saying, well, God's invisible and tangible. There's no way to detect him. There's no way in which he manifests. And it just starts sounding like there's no content here. There's just nothing the believer saying other than just dogmatically insisting um, on this sentence. But there's no way to resolve it. There's no way to support it. There's no way to, to, to refute it. And Flu is offering a pretty um, vicious criticism. Flu's not even saying the believer's claim is false. He's saying the believer's claim doesn't even have any content. It doesn't mean anything. It's gibberish. It doesn't, it's not even on the table or on the playing field to be something that might be true or might be false. Okay, so of course lots of evidentialist theists think that if God wasn't real, the world would look much different. Flu doesn't really seem to have a beef with those folks. Okay, now this approach, as logical positivism sort of sweeps through different fields in philosophy, as it goes through philosophy of religion, there's this idea, um, sometimes brought, thought to be brought over from uh, moral theory, of, of something called non-cognitivism. That is, Flew seems to be suggesting that religious claims are non-cognitive. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. A non-cognitivist atheist denies that religious utterances are propositions. They're not the sort of speech acts that have truth values. They're more like emoting or singing or poetry or cheering. They're expressions of personal desires, feelings of subjugation, admiration, humility, worship, or something like that. So the non-cognitivist is saying, uh, look, 
it's not so much that these claims are true or false. We've been understanding them wrong. When people make religious claims, they're doing something else. It's a different kind of speech act. It's much more akin to some of these other kinds of speech acts we do that we don't treat as true or false or empirically disconfirmable. We don't attack Maya Angelou or some poet by saying, okay, well, what are the conditions of empirical verification for your poem? Well, that's not the right uh, uh, approach. That's not the right... Uh, the, the poem is a speech act that um, has a different purpose, it fulfills different functions, it does something different for us. It's not the sort of thing that you set up traps in the jungle to test to see if it's right. So when somebody says Jesus loves you, like this bumper sticker, or this license plate, um, or Jesus died for your sins, or God be with you, what are they really saying? What are they actually doing with that speech act? Well, here's the non-cognitivist translation. Here's what Jesus loves you really means, according to the non-cognitivist. He's saying, I have sympathy for your plight. We are all lowly and pathetic and in need of paternalistic comforting. You can have it if you perform certain kinds of behaviors and adopt a certain kind of personal posture with regard to your place in the world. When I do these things, I feel joyful, and I want you to feel joyful too. So when that guy is saying Jesus loves you with his... Uh, license plate or when they come knock on your door it's not so much that they're trying to get to convince you about the presence of some gardener in the jungle it's that they want you to participate in a certain kind of mode of life and they want you to adopt some behaviors and some feelings and uh, and, and that if you are having some of the same personal emotional psychological challenges that they're having, that were you to adopt this practice, um, you would feel better and you would have a kind of communion with this guy. And notice in that whole description, I've just talked about this relationship between these two people, the person who's presenting the claim, Jesus loves you, and the person who's listening. Um, it's a very different kind of interaction between two humans. If that's the kind of exchange, that's the kind of comforting and reassurance that we're after, rather than let's go look and see what sorts of things are real in the universe, what kinds of things exist out there on the planet. Very different kinds of activities and different kinds of speech activities. So Flew's argument here that's embedded in this parable, uh, while the background assumptions about logical positivism may have some internal challenges, Flew's argument does seem to suggest this really interesting um, uh, conclusion. At least some religious speech acts are probably better understood as non-cognitivist expressions than as full-blown empirical assertions. So if we're taking those to be empirical assertions, we may be missing the point. Really what's going on with some religious language is something more like this. And if we understand that, we actually get a lot of insight into a lot of what's going on in your church or your synagogue or your mosque um, in your weekly meetings. What they're doing there is not so much enumerating what objects exist in the world and what are the conditions that prove them. That was a weird sort of approach to take to the whole question of God. They're up to something different that has to do with this social interaction. Okay, so in conclusion about flu, um, flu's hard-nosed empiricism leads him to uh, argue that the real problem with religious claims is not that they are false, it's that they're meaningless. They don't even get on the true-false uh, playing field. What they allege to assert doesn't have any observable content or difference in the world. There are no circumstances that the believer would allow, even hypothetically, that would show that God exists isn't true. So the believer comes off looking really bad in Flew's parable about the jungle. Uh, so Flu is inclined to reject religious claims altogether as empty. Um, we saw just briefly that this whole business of um, equating meaningfulness with empirically verifiable, that criteria from logical positivism is based um, uh, on a, uh, that, that principle is suspect because that principle itself can't be empirically verified. That there's a self-referential uh, incoherence problem with the verificationist principle. So Flew's on some sketchy ground there, but Flew does ask, still I think ask this really important question, what if anything would lead you to change your mind? If the answer is nothing, are you being reasonable? 
are you actually asserting something about the world? And maybe what we uh, would be better off doing is understanding lots or maybe all religious uh, 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 religious speech acts as non-cognitivist speech acts. And once we do that, we appreciate them in a different way. And it's not so much about the existence or non-existence of God. It's about um, certain kinds of behavioral and personal social interaction uh, issues that humans have. Now, next we'll consider... Uh, R.M. Hare and Basil Mitchell, who've got some very interesting responses to uh, Flew's hard-nosed and